Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can explain the concepts of SET and SMV. So I'll explain what these acronyms stand for in a moment, but first I want to talk about the debate around this concept in general. So the debate here is around how we exchange products, services, ideas, and behaviors according to an economic model, as opposed to other popular ways like biological or political models. And really, the acronyms SET and SMV are a little confusing because SET actually stands for two different things. So SET can stand for sexual economics theory, and that's what I'm really talking about here, but it can also stand for social exchange theory, which is really an overarching philosophy that covers sexual economics theory. And SMV stands for sexual market value. So really this is just the value set, assuming that SET explains the economics accurately. So what that means is I'm really just going to focus on SET and not SMV, because you can figure out SMV once you understand SET. So this particular theory, SET, is something we see used by the men going their own way philosophy, the MGTOW philosophy, and sometimes by the involuntarily celibate philosophy, the incel community. So we see they take different components of SCT, but I've rarely seen the whole theory really explained out and then the alternative viewpoint kind of put in the same place. So I'm really going to focus here more on the SCT and not the components that refute it, not the different theorists that refute it, but I will cover both to some extent. So I'll look at the primary theory and then some of the, I think, more cohesive rebuttals against the theory. So what sexual economics theory does is it takes the private activity of sex and treats it as something that occurs in a marketplace. And essentially what we see here is that men and women play the roles of being the buyer and the seller and market forces influence the price just like they would in any market. So we see principles like supply and demand, exclusivity and collusion among buyers and sellers. So I'm going to explain this theory. I used a number of articles to help me do this. There have been many articles written on this topic. I'll put the references for the articles that I used in the description for this video. Again, some of these articles support this theory and others counter it. Now these papers really aren't experimental in nature. They are theoretical, although they do cite experimental studies to support some of their arguments. So another way of putting this, we see that there are researchers that have put something forward and others that have argued against what they've put forward, and it's based on really a potential explanation for observations, but not necessarily something derived from an experiment like we think of with like treatments, for instance. If we're using a treatment, we want to see if it's more effective than doing nothing or another treatment, that would be experimental. This is more theoretical. But again, we do see a lot of evidence presented from other studies. So they cite a lot of other studies in these articles that support the researcher's point of view. So those that refute this particular theory of SCT do make a lot of good points. They accuse SCT of having patriarchal overtones. They also present points in favor of feminist theory, which would be a major theory that opposes SCT. But because of really the time constraints and just the amount of material covered, I'm going to focus this video much more on SCT and just touch on the feminist theory that opposes this at the end a little bit. Again, there's just simply too much material to cover. Even in presenting the SCT argument, I'm only using really a fraction of what's available to explain this. So in taking a look at this construct of SCT, this theory, we see that the field of sexuality is driven by two major theoretical domains, the biological and we call social construction. And a lot of this social constructionist theory is really based on feminist theory. Feminist theory argues that women are subjugated by men and women respond to this oppressed position. So essentially when we talk about sexuality, we see biology and politics. And then with SCT, we see a new domain added to this, economics. So economics with human behavior, of course, is not new. We see this in prior literature, this theory is talked about, and we see four major assumptions in the general theory. So this would be, again, economics and human behavior. 
people are connected in a market, and individual choices are influenced by cost and benefits. When desirable resources become scarce, we see a price change. Sellers compete with one another, and occasionally buyers do as well, and individuals look to maximize their outcomes. So again, this conceptualization is not new. This is generally considered social exchange theory, and it's been used to conceptualize sexual activity before as well. But with the prior discussions, we don't see exactly what we have here with sexual economics theory, because sex wasn't treated as belonging to a man or a woman. Now, SCT looks at this differently. It essentially says that culture assigns female sexuality value, whereas male sexuality is thought of as worthless. So essentially, in order for sex to happen under this theory, something needs to be exchanged for it, right? So if one side has value and the other side does not have value, that's going to facilitate an exchange. A number of different constructs can be exchanged, consideration, affection, respect, commitment, material gifts, and of course sometimes money. But this is more or less moving away from this theory. This theory is thought of as somewhat relational and not strictly transactional, although the money part does play a role in it. So when we see the term price of sex, they're not necessarily talking about money, like for example with prostitution. So as I mentioned before, this is a pretty controversial theory, and it's easy to see why. What we really see here with SET is, again, this part about sex being a female resource. So what evidence supports this kind of crucial part of their theory? Well, first we see the principle of least interest. This is where someone gains power in a relationship by wanting a connection less than somebody else. And of course, it can be used outside the context of relationships as well. But really, this is a lot like avoidance and approach when we talk about attachment theory. The person who avoids in a relationship has more power. The person who approaches has less power. Now, second, we see that research indicates that men have a greater sexual motivation. Of course, this is refuted by other studies, but this is what we see with SCT. And we see that, looking at the research, this argument is supported on almost every way of measuring the construct of sexual motivation. What evidence supports this? What results do we see from studies? Well, men desire sex more at every stage of a relationship, early, late, and even outside of the relationship. Men are less successful when they attempt to be celibate, and this speaks more over to that MGTOW community I was talking about before, the men going their own way community. We see that men desire a higher number of partners. They expend more resources to obtain sex. They take more risks to obtain sex. They refuse sex less often. They have more frequent fantasies about sex, and they're less prone to report a lack of desire for sex. So now looking at the factors under SCT, the assumptions for this market to be in place, we see four assumptions here. We see this assumption that generally men want sex more than women. Generally, women want the resources that men have. We see that women are free to make decisions about sex. That's important to this economics theory. And we see that information about the sexual activities of others must be known, at least to some degree, so the price can be known. So with that in mind, what factors would influence the price under this theory? Well, there are two main types of factors, individual factors and market factors. And then two things that can happen. We can see the price increase or decrease. So the price would be raised or lowered. So in terms of individual factors that would raise the price, we see factors like a woman being attractive, competition among men for a specific woman, and a woman who has had few or no prior sexual relationships. Individual factors that would lower the price, a woman's age being past young adulthood, if a woman lacks alternative access to resources, or if a man has a much higher status than a woman. In terms of market factors, market factors that raise the price, monopolistic manipulation, so collusion to restrict access to women, and a larger pool of men than women. Again, that would raise the price. In terms of market forces that lower the price, permissive sexual norms, men having access to low-cost substitutes, including prostitutes, and fewer men than women. So there are a few keys here in terms of this particular theory. With this theory, a woman is looking for one optimal mate. 
whereas men may or may not be. We see sex here is essentially a renewable resource, but reputation is not, meaning it's more about how a woman is perceived as opposed to what they actually do. When a man is accused of having too many partners, that doesn't matter, but it does matter to a woman. So here we see kind of an interesting intersection between sexual economics theory and feminist theory. Feminist theory says that men seek to subjugate women, which includes denying women economic opportunity. And furthermore, this theory says that this is motivated primarily for a desire for power and secondarily for sex. What SET says is that men do this to keep the price of sex low. So essentially, SET agrees with feminist theory in some ways, including on this point. But rather, men aren't primarily looking for power, but rather sex. So what we see is that, again, men are trying to keep this price low, and if women have a lot of resources, that would raise the price. So certainly this is an interesting and controversial theory, but what does the research literature say? What do we see that supports this theory? And again, I'll talk about what contradicts the theory a little later. So there are a number of elements that we see put forward as support for this. Again, I'm only covering just a few of these. So the first would be the gender imbalance around the construct of prostitution. We see with prostitution that the vast majority of clients are men and the vast majority of prostitutes are women. If we were to contradict this part of the theory, we would have to find examples of women paying for sex, for example, in the research literature, but we can't. Looking at studies, we don't see really any examples of this happening. So what about areas where this exchange of money would be more disguised? So not prostitution, but rather in something like a marriage, right? So again, making this argument, that there's a gender imbalance here. Well, we have seen studies where women who lack their own independent means of financial support were less willing to refuse sex from their husbands, to refuse those advances. So, again, more support around this one point. But what about something like infidelity? Does infidelity support the idea of SCT? Again, with SCT, male sexuality has no value, and female sexuality does. So with female infidelity, essentially something valuable is being given away, whereas with male infidelity, nothing of value is being given away. And this is actually consistent with what we see across many cultures. Women are judged much more harshly for infidelity than are men. Moving over to courtship factors, we see that some of these are fairly straightforward. We see this expectation that men will buy gifts, pay for dinner, spend time, and issue a declaration of love. Also, there are other courtship rituals that seem to support SCT. Research has looked into the correlation between when people thought sex should start in a relationship and when it actually began. And what we see for women here is the correlation is very high. Sex began when they preferred, whereas men wanted sex to commence much earlier than women did. What about supply and demand aspects around like a shortage of mates? Well, we see in situations where there are fewer women, Cultural values tend to change, moving more toward discouraging premarital and extramarital sex. Looking at sexual attitudes, we see that men hold more favorable attitudes towards casual sex than women do. And one of the most cited studies that kind of illustrates this point involves research on a college campus that used what are called confederates. So confederates are individuals who are going along with the researchers. They work for the researchers. So you have participants who participate in the study, and then you have confederates. So we see here that confederates approached members of the opposite sex on a college campus, and they had one of several offers. The one that really stands out is they made an invitation to have sex that same night with that person. So just like all of sexual economics theory, we're talking about heterosexual relationships here. So you have a female confederate approaching a male, and a male confederate approaching a female. So what we see here is that 75% of the male participants, so those approached by a female confederate, agreed to have sex that same night. Now, of course, this was a research study, so no sex actually took place, but they agreed to it. In terms of the males approaching females and asking the same question, 0% of the females agreed to that same offer. Another factor we see put out in support of SCT is the idea of sex as a benefit. Studies show that men describe sex as a benefit to participating in a romantic relationship, 
where women generally do not rate sex as a benefit at all. Men report that one of the benefits to cross-sex relationships is the potential access to sex. But again, it's not listed as a benefit for women who talk about cross-sex relationships in research studies. So the last area I'll cover here, and again, there are several others that I did not cover in terms of factors that are used to support sexual economics theory. This last one is female aggression. We see that, of course, men get involved in physical fights more often than women. But when we do see fights between women, the physical fights are often preceded by comments related to promiscuity and attractiveness. And this is not the case in terms of precipitating factors in fights between men. And female to female aggression is more common when there's a relative shortage of men. So again, just a few of the factors that we've seen put forth supporting SCT. So what about some of the counterpoints to sexual economics theory? Well, most of the counterpoints come from individuals who study the feminist theoretical point of view. So that's the one I'm going to use here in terms of, again, the research literature that I read. So this is really a brief argument, again, compared to what I presented in terms of supporting SCT. So we see here in terms of the counterpoints, SCT dehumanizes women. So essentially, it paints this picture that female bodies are really just a commodity. We see that most heterosexual couples have similar interests, they have mutual attraction, similar goals and values. So this wasn't stated in the research, but another way you could put this is that there's this idea that people really do fall in love, and maybe that's really explaining what's happening as opposed to some really behavioristic economic model. We also see here, in terms of the counterpoints, that Patriarchal societies deny women equal personhood and really force women into this sexual exchange model or this sexual economics model. So under this point, feminist theorists aren't really denying that SCT might explain some of what's going on, but they're saying women are forced into it by another theory. Feminist theory also disputes some of the assertions made in SCT directly around this idea that women repress female sexuality. Feminist theorists argue that men generally have more sexist attitudes and that research consistently shows this is true across many cultures. We see the feminist theorists dispute the research methodology that says women are more in favor of the sexual double standard. They actually cite research that shows that men are more in favor of the standard. Now remember, women being more in favor of a double standard is consistent with SET. We also see that the feminist theory disputes the idea that men or more interested in sex than women. So this one I think is more of an uphill battle if we look at a lot of the research that's out there, right? Especially some of the points I mentioned before, which seem to be fairly solid in terms of demonstrating the interest in sex is much stronger for men. But one of the factors here in terms of disputing this is they look at specifically that study that showed that 75% of those male participants agreed to sex that same night with one of the Confederates. They conclude from the same research that men are simply perceived as less trustworthy sexual partners. So it was the unknown element that really caused the female participants to say no, essentially. And there are some other research studies that would support that disputing of this other study. So I don't really have time to go through all of the other studies they talked about, but they put forward some good studies, I think, that made this point more debatable. At first, it doesn't seem like it's easy to win this point, but one of the papers specifically I think made a good argument here to neutralize this point in favor of SCT and really put this on more level ground. Now the last point I'll mention here in terms of the counterpoints is that sexual economics theory is hostile to gender equality. Now this is kind of interesting because really SCT just is what it is, right? Like it's a theory. And we see that the feminist theorists acknowledge that Theorists can't be responsible if somebody appropriates their theory. And I think that is what happened here, right? Some people take SCT and they turn it into something it's really not. And they use it to kind of wage a war against gender equality, right? So this point really isn't saying necessarily that SCT is wrong. It's saying that people have misinterpreted SCT, right? So still a good point. We have to be careful about how theories are interpreted 
and used, right? We want to make sure that people accurately understand what a theory says and what it doesn't say. So those are some of the counterpoints. And of course, before I made some of the points that are put forth to support SCT. This is such a controversial topic. I'd like to see more objective research in this area. When you read all these papers, and I read quite a bit to get to this point for this video, you do get this sense that from really all these articles, that there's this bias on each side. A bias by those who wrote the papers on SCT in terms of towards supporting it, which seems obvious, and a bias towards feminist theory by those offering counterpoints. Bias is really universal, and even scientists can't escape it, which is unfortunate because it makes it harder to find the truth. I think in terms of sexuality, it's likely that it can be explained by taking components from all these theories, biological, social construction, as well as economics, which is actually acknowledged in the literature that I read. Sexuality is an extremely complex construct, and as we start to try to unravel it, it just seems like it creates more and more different theoretical approaches, and we just get so much information, it can be really overwhelming. I don't know if this debate will ever be settled by the scientific literature, but again, I would like to see more researchers try and move toward the truth of how these different dynamics actually function. Now, one last interesting point I want to mention is that when I was working on the videos for the MGTOW philosophy or community or whatever it's referred to as, and the incel community. I saw really, you know, a lot of vitriol and some good points as well, but a lot of enthusiasm and energy and really kind of negative feelings being spread kind of all over those forums and of course directed toward other people. And what I find interesting is that the scientific literature does actively debate these topics, right? You see from this community, there's this idea that they've been shut out, they're on the outside, and they need to really argue for their point by being hostile and aggressive, but they don't. They could join the scientific community and study this like a researcher. Now, I know that's not available to everybody as an option, but I think there's this anti-science bias that I've seen where they might look at some of these studies and kind of cherry pick points in their favor, but I don't get this feeling they're really reading these studies and interpreting them as entire articles and the context of what we know from the scientific literature. Anti-science bias seems to be very popular, especially among people who start to adopt extremist views. Now, I've talked before about how not everybody in MGTOW has an extremist view, and not everybody who considers themselves a part of the incel community has an extremist view either, but some certainly do. And when people adopt these extremist views, the first thing out the window is science, right? I mean, there's, again, such a lively debate that we can engage in, whether somebody wants to become a researcher or not, they can still read these articles and really get involved in the debate at that level. What do we know from actual scientific findings? But we don't see that really happening. And I'm disappointed in a way because it just cuts off a lot of people from access to information that I think is fairly interesting and much more accurate than just guessing and, again, becoming enthusiastic and exciting and just acting on emotions. So I think that what would help understanding would be to reduce the emotional output a bit, right, and read more, right? My solution is read more. Read more and bring kind of intelligent, cohesive points to the table for discussion and argument. Arguing can be fun, even if it's based on science, right? It doesn't have to be something that's miserable where everybody starts getting threatening and hateful and all that. That type of behavior really doesn't help anyone, and it doesn't help anyone to establish the points they want to make. Even if inside those points there's some legitimate aspect, they get erased when emotions are high. People don't want to listen to the vitriol, and I understand why. So just some thoughts in terms of like these communities, again, especially people on the extreme edges of these communities, and what we see in the scientific literature, and what we can discover from science. So I know whenever I talk about topics including sexuality and sexual economics theory, there are going to be a variety of opinions, people who agree with me and disagree with me and who have other thoughts. Please put those opinions in the comments section. They always generate a really interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found this description of sexual economics theory to be interesting. Thanks for watching.